We're live, the launch of the story. It's been a few months in the making, uh, yet it's the quickest ty- It's the quickest uh, whiskey that's ever come to market, Irish whiskey that's ever come to market uh, in the United States. So I'm excited for the launch tonight, for the kickoff. Looking forward to sharing with you the story, the sips, and a great session ahead of us. So uh, let us know if you've got your bottles ready, if you've got your bottle of the story on hand. Let me know where you're coming from. Uh, Greg Anderson is the first in the door from Jacksonville, Florida. Good man, Greg. Great to see you. Tell us uh, where else are you joining us from with your bottle of the story. They found their way all across the United States and even further afield. Um, And it's been amazing seeing all the pictures, all the images, all the videos you've shared of the story making its way to every corner of the world, places we never thought the story would end up in. Dublin, Ohio is here. Stephen Colorado is here, Brian Riley, got Ed Stannard, Kevin Wilson, David Stewart. David says the story is being poured in West Los Angeles at the moment. Fantastic. Rick Green, who's been taking a picture every single day of his bottle, is in Columbus. Great stuff. Caitlin Herbman, uh, great to see you. You're ready near Kalamazoo in Michigan. Laura Hughes is in Torrance, California. Byram, New Jersey. Carlo in Ireland, Dublin, Ohio, Canada, Milford, Connecticut, Troy, Ohio. We have the whole map covered. There isn't a, a spot on the globe where the story hasn't <laughs> hasn't landed or hasn't affected lives. <laughs> David Cash is in Chandler, Arizona. Nicholas is in Stowe, Massachusetts. Johnny is in Long Beach, New York. The story is poured, poured and breathing, he says. Um, ready to pour to Oakland, California with Brian Faulkner. So we are... Uh, Going to have a great session tonight to launch this whiskey. You're all so very welcome to what is going to be a really historic event. It's the first ever Irish whiskey that we've launched to our community. It's the first ever ever collaboration we've had uh, uh, in in releasing a whiskey, and we couldn't be more excited. I couldn't be more excited. So we're going to go in a minute or two uh, to uh, County Clare, to where the story began, and we'll bring Louise in in a second, who will start our night off. Uh, from a very interesting location in County Clare. But I'll give everybody a chance to to join in. Kelly Spears Ryan is joining us from Beaver Creek, Ohio. Jeff is in Buffalo, New York. Great stuff. Nina Williams in Bellflower, California. Peter Ake is in Born Born in Texas. Killarney, James and Donegal. Good to see you, James. Eamon Malone is in Boston, Massachusetts. East Indianapolis for Jeff. Great stuff. Great, great stuff. Maureen's waiting on her bottle. It's in Chicago as she tries to bootleg it across borders. Yeah, a lot of people with their with their very creative bootlegging efforts, that's for sure. Uh, let me see. Kevin Turkington, greetings from Webster, New York. Great to see so many of you joining. So we're going to go. Uh, let's uh, go now to County Clare, and let's bring in uh, our partner on this project, our friend Louise McGuan coming to us from Cora Clare and County Clare. Louise, you're very welcome to your own launch. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's it's great to be here. We're coming um, live at midnight, West Coast of Ireland time, uh, live from our lovely rack house here on our farm in County Clare. And welcome, everybody. Um, it's going to be a great night. We have a canine companion as well. He, he was uh, that wasn't invited necessarily to the launch, but all are welcome. Ruby has been very involved in uh, every chapter of the story. She's been been beside me, picking casks, uh, disgorging casks, bottling. She's a very important part of the team. So it's <laughs> here tonight, definitely. Well, welcome, Ruby, and welcome everybody who's joining us from all over the United States. This is a great night. It's so everyone has been so good in not opening their bottles. Um, you know, we we made a, an early comment. Maybe you should keep them closed until our launch event, and that became the gospel. Nobody opened their bottles, or if, if one did, they were immediately chastised publicly and and hung, drawn, and quartered. But tonight's the night where we officially get to open them. Yeah, and you're in for a treat. Um... It's a really special blend, actually. We didn't scrimp at all on cask selection on the on the story. And um, when Barry first came with this idea, I knew we wanted to deliver something that was really, really qualitative. So we we dug deep uh, in terms of our cask selection here and pulled out some really special casks. So 
Um, it's a pretty spectacular blend, I think. It's one of the ones that is um, that has taken some of the older and more rare uh, stocks that we have here to create something really well balanced and uh, something we can be very proud of. Uh, I think it's the first in Irish whiskey to launch a whiskey like this, so it's only fitting that uh, we dug deep in terms of our cask selection for it. Uh, we've been very lucky with what you've chosen, and I know you're going to give us a little tour around in a second of, of the, the rack house and, and the casks that are there. Uh, this all started back in August, which isn't that long ago in the world of whiskey, or in bringing anything to market, let alone whiskey, a thing that is uh, something that takes typically a long, long time and a lot of patience. But this started with an idea and a phone call. I remember the phone call. I was standing about 10 feet from where I am today, and I just called you up and said, look, I have an idea. And... Uh, to your credit, you said we can do it. <laughs> That's right. I mean, I think, look, we're a whiskey bonder. So um, this kind of sort of bespoke, very small scale um, uh, uh, whiskey making is really kind of what we do. It's a big, big part of what we do. And like, it's essentially what the whiskey bonders of old used to do for their individual customers way back in the day. So it's just that we've done it in a very modern way. You know, we've, we've done this. Uh, internationally in a different country and through this amazing group that you've man managed to put together. So it's sort of taking a very old concept, heritage concept of a very bespoke, uh, small scale uh, whiskey, but uh, taking it global uh, through the power of the internet. So it's a beautiful coming together of those two worlds, I think. Uh, we do have an amazing community. Uh, so many have turned out. We have more than 100 and 1,520 people I see here right now at the moment uh, who've come together and have believed in this mad idea and this crazy idea and have been along for the journey. Um, we uh, will be opening the, our, our whiskey in a little bit. I know many of you are impatient and some of you have bored holes in the side of the bottle to stick a straw in, um, but we'll open those bottles shortly. But before we do that, just a, a reminder that this was th this all started as an idea to do two things. One was to have a whiskey that celebrated our community, something that we could call our own a limited release whiskey, something that wouldn't be available anywhere else, just to our community, a short run. And the second idea was a project that would help showcase the story of Irish whiskey, the bonding, the blending process, the journey of a, of a whiskey to the United States. And so for the last three or four months, everyone has followed along. We've all enjoyed the journey along the way to finally getting this whiskey in our hands, which seems like a, a, an insurmountable uh, task to get the whiskey from where you're standing to where we're all sitting around the world today. Um, Louise, I wonder if you could, I mean, the journey all then started right where you are. Um, tell us where you are and what happens in that in that particular space. So we're standing in uh, our bonded warehouse, uh, our rack house, as we call it, here on the family farm. And for those of you who don't know us, um, uh, we're a whiskey bonder. Uh, JJ Carey, we're a whiskey bonder. Uh, we're not a distillery. We don't distill. We never will. Rather, this is what we do. Um, we essentially collect uh, and curate a library of whiskey flavors from all over the country, from old distilleries, the older, more well-known distilleries around the island, and also from the newer distilleries that are setting up uh, all around the country now. Um, whiskey bonding was once very common in Ireland. Uh, if the next time you visit Ireland, when you're driving around, you'll see pubs with the term whiskey bonder very often written in gold letters. Uh, on their windows or above the doors. And that's very much kind of a hangover from the 1800s, early 1900s, when every town in Ireland had three or four whiskey bonders. And they were essentially mercantile owners. You know, they sold, they sold ammunition, they sold tea, they sold musical instruments, bicycle parts, and they also sold alcohol, and in particular whiskey. And in the case of whiskey, um, they were just sourcing whiskey from local distilleries that were nearby to them. And then they were very often blending that whiskey um, for, for individual customers in the town um, uh, and selling that on under their own brand name. And it was a really common way of making whiskey in Ireland until about the 1930s there or thereabout. And then it basically just completely died out uh, because the Irish whiskey industry had a tough road around that time. So we are very much part of a new wave of, of independent Irish whiskey makers that are starting to sort of come up in the world. And um, our model is to bring that way of, of making Irish whiskey back. Uh, so we're whiskey bonders. And it's a really good time to be a whiskey bonder because um, I think last count, day before yesterday, they, they, there was 38 distilleries 
on the island of Ireland. And when I founded this business um, less than four or five years ago, there was only four. So um, what you see around us here, and I'll give you a little tour if you want to follow me. Um, we're Great. surrounded here on all sides by casks, uh, ranging in age from zero to about 30 years old. Um, we classify all of these casks, essentially, you can see down here, um, into individual flavor profiles. So every time we source a cask, um, we put it into a particular flavor block and then we store it away. So that when we go to blend a whiskey, we kind of have a general direction of an idea that we want to take the whiskey in. And um, we then pull from these flavor blocks to create that whiskey. Um, it's just like blending and bringing flavors together. Um, and we're constantly building up the, the, the stores of stocks that we have. So if you come this way, um, you'll see it does go on for quite a bit. So we've got rows and rows of whiskey here. Um, we're going to be building another rack house to sort of to, to, to accommodate a lot of the new make whiskey that we're, we're buying in from smaller distilleries around the island. Um, but what you see in front of you here are stocks of some of our much, much, much older whiskeys which have kind of already finished maturing, to be frank, like they only have a couple of years to go. So we tend to keep all of those right here on the farm and uh, at hand for when we go blending. Um, so if you follow me this way, um, you'll see some of our rare stocks over here. These kind of range in age from uh, about 18 to about 30 years old. Um, if you come over here, this entire line here this is all 30 year old um, Irish whiskey that's in sherry casks. Uh, this one says pure joy on it because that's how we all feel about it. It's a particularly spectacular um, uh, whiskey. And these are all really, really rare. And we actually pulled from this particular cask here uh, for the story. So there's about 2% of this particular malt, this uh, sherry influenced um, 30 year old malt in the story. Um, this is some of the rarest whiskey stock on the island of Ireland. Um, there isn't a huge amount of very, very old, very, very old whiskey in Ireland like there is in Scotland. And um, it, it can add in a really amazing top note to any whiskey. So when, when we pulled out the story and we started blending it, I knew that we wanted to have some of this in there to make it super special. Um, I'll give you a quick demonstration, like what it's like to kind of make a whiskey uh, like the story or the process that goes around it. So um, it's pretty fun, I have to say. You get to clamber over all these casks all day long. And in the case of the story, um, this, is, this is one of the uh, 2002 casks that we pulled. So um, the story is comprised of about 2% of this 30 year old, and then about 36% of this 2002 malt. That's 18 year old malt. And we use two different casks uh, for that. Um, and these are very kind of nice tropical fruit sort of casks. And the way that we work is really kind of hands on. Um, we're just constantly tasting and opening and all the rest of it. And on a typical day, this is kind of what I do all day long. Um, and this is very much sort of part of uh, blending of the story. We're just dipping in like that, pulling out samples. And then it's just a case of trial and error um, when we're pulling it to blend together. Now, this 2002 cask is particularly full of really nice sort of um, almost like mature kind of uh, tropical fruits. So kind of uh, imagine if you had a guava or a mango that's kind of really, really soft and squishy on the outside. Not super, super, super ripe, but like almost going the other direction. Super uh, delicious. And that is the kind of a tonality that you'll find a lot in Irish whiskey. Certainly in JJ Curry whiskeys, this is something that we really, really chase down. So the two 2002 casks that went into the story very much have these kind of tonalities to them. Slancha, wish you were here. <laughs> You're tasting whiskey without us. Mm -hmm. Delicious. We have people drooling, wondering if there's apprenticeships to be uh, apprenticeships available under your tutelage in the rack house. 
and uh, whether people can live there and sleep there. You know what? You're, you anybody who bought a bottle it has a free ticket to come and visit, obviously. So um, anybody who bought a bottle, you have an open invitation to come here. We'll get you to open a cask and uh, uh, taste directly out of it. It's part of the tour. So all I'm doing here is merely demonstrating that. And yes, I've always wanted to put a four poster bed in here because it's a very, it smells amazing in here. Um, we have a, a clay floor that underneath our feet, um, meaning that like it, uh, the, the sound is kind of really dampened down. So it's a very quiet, calm and soothing place to be. And in the early years of the business, and I still do it sometimes, I actually sometimes come in here and just lie down in between the racks because it's just, <laughs> You can just feel all of that whiskey maturing. It's, it's a lovely, calming kind of place to be. But yeah, this was when, when Barry and I first spoke, the first thing I did um, was think in my head, okay, how can we wait? How can we, we make a whiskey that's deserving of this? Uh, and we came out to the rack house and started to just pull things and um, uh, started to construct uh, a kind of a blend. And I know we'll go into this in a minute, but the kind of the, the result of that was after these kind of rack house sessions, um, we then kind of had four or five different directions that the blend could go in. Uh, and that's when Barry and Larry and I sat down and started to kind of work through um, the, the best sort of direction. But anything to do with whiskey bonding, uh, it starts here in the rack house. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have great relationships with some amazing distilleries around the island. Um, we're also fortunate enough to have great relationships with cooperages around the world. And for us, that's like really important. You know, we're all about shepherding the, the spirit uh, from the second it comes off the still until it gets into that bottle that's, that's kind of right there in front of you. So, yeah, that's the rack house. It's amazing. Um, I, I think you, you uh, glossed over the fact that all of those invitations to visit were actually uh, uh, invitations to come and work they are not take a tour and I see how you've kind of hidden it kind of disguised it as a tour but really it's about people rolling casks for you probably and digging dirt and helping exactly. out but, but this is work too you know opening casks smelling nosing tasting that's also a very part, important part of a whiskey bonders work so it's not all bad I remember driving through the gates of the farm what is probably a year and a half ago now myself and, and Mrs Stories and Sips and uh getting the tour around and, and you opening the cask and us drinking from the cask and it is a special thing it's uh you probably take it for granted now that you do it every day but it's such a special moment because most people me included at the time really only have access to the whiskey from the bottle rarely from the cask so it is something very special it is like i think it's a part of the whiskey making process that you don't get to go behind the scenes of very often because um I think we get we get very focused sort of on you know the big beautiful copper pot still and that kind of thing and i have to say like the beauty of being a whiskey bonder is that um i get to work with incredibly talented uh distillers and i get to in, in work with spirit that has been created by incredibly uh talented dis distillers as well um so that just gives me the freedom then to focus on everything after distillation um, all of the kind of cast management, the wood sourcing, uh, the blend, the, 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 the care we can take in the blend and the time we can take with it. We're just kind of freed up because we don't have all of that part of the process. And I love sharing this with people because um, there's something lovely, like just the smell like whiskey and wood, that smell of them maturing together. Uh, it is one of the, the, the more um, magical smells on the planet. Like it really is an incredible smell. Um, and, it, and just these kind of aromas walking in here every day, it's, it's, it's incredible. I'm very, very fortunate to be in the line of work that I am and to share it with you guys. If anybody's got any questions while Louise is here in the rack house, she'll be moving locations in a second and we'll be bringing in another guest uh, all the way from Chicago, believe it or not, which is a little surprise in a second. Uh, but if anyone's got any questions for Louise, feel free to put them in the chat there and, uh, she'll answer them while balancing on the top of a cask in a unique manner. Um, okay. Lots of really excited people wishing they could be there right now and can't wait to get there. So I would expect, uh, I would anticipate having to uh, take many of those uh, those story vouchers in return for a tour over the next year, all going to plan. You're all very welcome. You're very, very welcome. Uh, one question from Demetrius. He wonders, uh, how do you control yourself uh, with being surrounded by so much uh, pure joy? Um, 
I have to keep myself away from some of these sometimes. Like the, there's one cask in here, um, one of the 30 year old casks that, you know, the, to be honest, I think it'd be worth quite a lot of money today. I bought it several years ago, but it's, they're very rare whiskeys and they're worth a lot of money. And I, we had a board meeting last year and I, I agreed with the entire board that we were never going to sell that one particular cask um, because uh, it's just sort of super, super special. Um, so we mostly control ourselves, but occasionally there's one that's just too good. I don't want it to get away. Um, but yeah, there is, there is some restraint that you have to have uh, if you work in the whiskey business, there's no doubt. Why are some casks stored on their side and some straight up, asks Kevin. Yeah, so good question. If I come down here. Uh, so if you look here, so these guys, this is a new parcel of, um, this is 20, this is a parcel of 21 and 20 year old whiskey that I just recently purchased. And this whiskey has been stored this way, upright its entire life. Um, so if I put it on its side right now, I'm just going to get a lot of leaks. Uh, because what happens is when you store a cask uh, upright like this, the, the, there's, there's going to be like a bit of space lit in, inside between um, the head of the cask and the, the liquid. So what happens over time is that that means the head will dry out. And then if you suddenly put the casks on their side, they start to leak. Um, so our all of our new make whiskey, the zero year old whiskey that we, we source, I go away to Kentucky or uh, Spain or wherever to, to Mexico sometimes to source casks and all of that new make stuff gets stored on its side uh, because we have full control over maturation from beginning to end. Um, these, uh, these are going to get blended pretty soon as well and they've just, come, they've just come in a couple of months ago. So I won't even put them on their sides yet because um, they'll just leak. Now, anything we have full control over goes on its side and the reason is uh, it's traditional. I'm a believer in incremental benefits. JJ Corey, when he was a whiskey bonder, would have stored his, his whiskey like this. Um, they still store their whiskey like this, obviously in Kentucky uh, and a lot of other places. Um, our intention is predominantly to do everything on its side. And in our new rack house, we'll be doing the same thing. So all of this stock here is all sourced on its side. Um, Anything that's leaky or potentially a little bit leaky has to stay upright. Very good. Very good. Um, two more questions before um, we bring in Claire from Chicago. And Claire, if you're uh, watching there from behind the scenes, uh, get your get your camera ready and your microphone. We'll be bringing you in in a second. Um, Paul's wondering if uh, isn't midnight the time when the angels come from their share, come for their share in the rack house? Have you spotted any? We, we, we get away with it. Like, so we don't have angels here in County Clare. Interesting fact, actually. Funny you should bring it up. So we, uh, we're in County Clare, right, on the West Coast. And uh, there are a lot of kind of stories about the fairy folk and the wee folk and that kind of thing in this part of the world. We're a very superstitious crowd. So here on the farm, we have what's known as a fairy fort. And inside that fairy fort, there's a fairy tree that's growing, right? And I grew up with that fairy fort and that fairy tree. You do not mess with the fairies. Uh, uh, you, you do not um, insult them. You do not go into the fairy fort after midnight, all that kind of stuff. So my offering to the fairies here on the farm is not the angel shares, the fairy share. So here on the farm, that's what they, that's what they can take. And by the way, I'm delighted to give it to them because the fairies can cause an awful amount of divilment if you let them. You you got to take care of the fairies. Rule number one. Fairies. A lot of people overlook that rule and go straight to rule number two, uh, not realizing that the poor fairies will come for them. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, last question: When you blend uh, from Robert, when you blend different age whiskeys, how do you put an actual age on the on the bottle then? You can't really. So you guys don't have an age statement on there because there's a very strange law. I used to put all of my ages on all of our whiskeys and be really transparent. And then I just got, I almost got threatened with like, I got taken to court and all sorts of stuff. It was terrible. So there's a very weird um, law about labeling whiskey that you are only allowed to list the youngest whiskey in the blend, right? So this whiskey has 30 year old um, 
uh, uh, 18-year-old, uh, 14-year-old, and uh, 10-year-old in it, right? So in theory, we could only really um, say 10-year-old, even though the, the majority of this whiskey actually be the older malts. So for that reason, we don't tend to put an age statement on it. If, if it's 100% 25-year-old, you can say 25-year-old. But otherwise, you're unfortunately, you're not allowed to list things, everything that's in it by age. You're only allowed to list the youngest component. So we tend to avoid it. And then instead, we just tell you in stuff like this. We'll tell you on social media. We'll tell you on Twitter. We'll tell you on Facebook. We're not allowed to put it on the label for now. That might change. Very good. Um, thanks for that, uh, that answer. And we've got more questions we'll, we'll get to when we get inside the house. Um, but if we were, if this, if the world was turning in a normal manner this year, we might have had this launch in a very different way. We might have had it live there from the farm. We might have had it from a, a pub in Coeur Claire. But in the absence of that, we have to change our approach slightly. But it's not going to stop us having a bit of a session, is it? No, I hope not. <laughs> okay. So who should we bring in to start our session off properly? <laughs> okay. So Claire, who's waiting in the wings there, Claire Sheedy, is actually my cousin. She is my cousin's daughter, as a matter of fact. And Claire spent last summer in Ireland here on the farm and um, actually getting our visitor experience ready. Uh, she, she, she was amazing. You know, she, she helped me to kind of renovate this lovely barn that we have and everything. And Claire is based in Chicago. Uh, and she's an incredibly talented singer and uh, she's going to sing a couple of things for us tonight. One of the songs eventually will be the Chapel Gates of Corey Clare, which is very, you'll hear it sung in every pub here in Corey Clare when you come. Um, but yeah, it's a family affair tonight. It's my cousin Claire all the way from Chicago. Claire, you're very welcome. It's a, an international affair here tonight, a family affair and an international affair. I know, I can't, I feel like I can't, uh... I can feel the magnitude of it with all the Facebook comments. <laughs> but by hiring her family, does does Louise get to skirt uh, human resource laws, uh, or uh, is everything has ever been everything been above board uh, during your time there? You know, I I've suspected that's the reasoning, um, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to think more about it. So Claire, you're going to give us a, a song or two this evening. Uh, Louise, you're going to transition, I believe, to a different part of the farm so that we can crack open our bottles. You're going to move from the rack house. So what we're going to do is, Louise, we're going to let you take that long trek to the house and yep. then you're going to join us again in a second. And then Claire's going to give us a, a lovely transitional tune with maybe a, a Claire influence. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll see you inside the house. Great, see you soon. All right. Claire, um, so Louise mentioned the, the Chapel Gates of Cura Claire being a famous one. Uh, are there other, what other uh, songs do you feel represent Claire and the night we have here? Um, I also have the Parting Glass um, prepared to sing. We might have to end with that one. <laughs> so I can start with the Chapel Gates. I think that's probably a good one to set the. All right. Why don't you start with that one and then tell us, and uh, once you're finished, maybe tell us a little bit about it. And uh, I bet Louise is going to get you to sing it again before the night is out. But uh, if there's an anthem like that for, for Cora Claire, it has to be sung more right. than once. So um, why don't you, in your own time, take it away? Sure. I've been away from Ireland now for nearly 50 years. And thoughts of home are still so dear to me. Often I'll gaze across the ocean and my eyes grow dim with tears. Let me tell you of the visions that I've seen. As a baby child, I stood there as the summer sun did shine across the steeple of that little church down there. And we gathered every evening while the weather would be fine around the chapel gates in Cora Claire. So in dreams I'd love to ramble down the village street 
and meet the boys and girls gathered there for to sing the good old songs telling of old Ireland's wrongs around the chapel gates in cool Clare. Now I'm growing old and weary in this land so far away. But I'll return to Ireland yet if God will spare. And when all is done, they'll lay me down at the closing of my days. Inside the chapel gates in Coolaclare. Inside the chapel gates in Coolaclare. That's it. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. That's that's haunting. Um, some amazing comments. People absolutely loving your rendition of that, Claire. Beautiful voices, says Thank Ryan. Uh, Ed says lovely voice. What what's the? Do you know anything about that song? It's its origin or its its history. Um, I know that it has a little bit of a mysterious history, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I don't. I think that the writer of the song is unknown. Um, but it's very popular in Cora Claire. It's, as you said, kind of like the, the town anthem. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, well, we might get you to, to sing it again before the night is out. It's, a, it's one of those songs that's kind of a anthemic that we'll, uh, for, uh, in a moody way. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll come back to you again. Uh, so Claire, uh, stand by, get, the, get those pipes warmed up again for us, and we'll uh, look forward to coming back to you shortly, all right? Thank you, we will do. Thanks, Claire. Beautiful voice there from Claire in Chicago, Claire Sheedy. So we'll be going to Louise in a second. Just going to give her a moment to get set up. While we're doing that, we will be drinking the story tonight. Don't you worry. So if you do have your uh, your bottles, I know many of you have already let them breathe and open them up. Feel free to do that uh, while we transition over to the indoor portion of our event tonight. Feel free to open your, your bottles, pour a little drop into your glass. Um, let me transition indoors with a quick video that Louise put together for us, Louise and her team. I know we've been keeping you up to date with videos along the way. Louise has been preparing some videos and sending them to us. Well, we got the, the last one of them today, and I want to share that with you before we start sipping on our wonderful story. So let me pull it up here. Turn your volumes up. Here we go.
Louise, honestly, like we're privileged to be part of this, like watching the footage and the journey along the way and seeing the labeling, the filling of the bottles. It's just such a joy for us. I mean, we're, it's a gift. It really is. Yeah, it's great fun making these. Like you, you saw there that the process is really very hands on. We don't have we don't have any machines, I don't think, <laughs> to be frank. Like we've got a little forehead filler. That's about it. Um, like there's a very technical piece of equipment there that you saw, um, which is a siphon. And uh, I, I bought that siphon at the local dairy co-op uh, because we needed a piece of equipment to take whiskey out of the barrel and the siphon seemed like the most logical thing because that because the story like many of the blends that we do is it's partial it's partial disgorgement of casks so we're not taking an entire cask and then disgorging that and then just blending it you're taking little bits of flavor from different casks and and that's kind of a really good indication of how we do that and how hands-on it is it's it's um it's it's very handmade it's it's astonishing. I mean, when we look at the labels now, we see the number two hundred on the bottle, and we see it being written there in the farm. It's just it's such a special thing. I don't know. I get very excited about this, and again, I, I can't say too many times how lucky we are to be part of this. A um, few questions before we we crack. Well, people have cracked it open. That's fine. But before we start tasting, uh, where did the idea come from to put the label on at a slant? We weren't the first to do that, were we? No, some of our releases are that sidewaysy uh, piece. Not very many, very special ones. So we have a single malt called the Flintlock that has that slanty label as well. And there's there's one or two others. It's not that many. Um, uh, but it's rare. For JJ Carr, it's very rare to have that kind of a label. So we tend to save it for, for very special things. I'll tell you what you, you guys do have is the you have the first ever bottle that has the sh like the shamrock on the bottom um and the the jj kari whiskey bonder around the top there like nobody else has that this is the first time we ever use that bottle so that's um super special like that the the logo down there like uh, that j that shamrock with jcj on it so that's like the original jj kari logo from like the 1800s that we just kind of bring out and I had that idea several years ago to do that. And this is the first time we've ever put that bottle in the wild. But yeah, to answer the question quickly, we do it very occasionally like that, but it's only for very rare special bottles. Uh, I presume at this stage, uh, we'd be recommending people pop open the corks and uh, pour a little bit into their glass and let it breathe there for a minute or two before we start officially tasting this. I have not yet opened my full bottle so people are wondering have i been tasting mine before tonight the last time i tasted it was when we tasted all the blends of cask strength which was quite a few months ago at this stage and we settled on blend number four and i have this will be my first time trying it and uh, with everybody else the plastic is still on my bottle um so i'm going to pop mine open um right here and pour a drop into my glass Listen to this pop. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Lovely, lovely pop. Nice full fill as well. You didn't, you didn't uh, shirk on the uh, filling, filling of the, of the bottles, right? No, to the I'm top. always giving out to Eric about the fill level, whether it's right or wrong. We've never really gotten it right. <laughs> um, it's a good, generous fill, I think. It's probably a bit over seven fifty. So you're getting bang for your buck there, definitely. Before we, before we talk about what's in the glass, before we. Um, taste this for the first time i want to bring in another key member of our team uh, to join us in a toast to this entire project and that is our friend larry uh, from folsom uh, working with folsom wine and spirits larry has done an incredible job larry you're very welcome thanks for joining us for our the toast for the story tonight well good to see you both good to see you and larry you and i are in the same state uh, we're miles away from cora claire but I wanted to, to bring in the, the, the team members who, who kind of pulled all this together so that we could raise our glasses uh, together with our community, our amazing community of Irish whiskey fans all over America and even further afield uh, to celebrate this incredible project. Uh, Larry and Louise, you've both knocked this out of the park and made it look effortless and seamless, which it, I know it hasn't been, uh, but you've done a remarkable job. Um, I, want, I, I put a few words together. I was trying to think about how do we 
what, how do you toast this? Um, and I don't know, but uh, I, I put some words together sitting down over the last few weeks thinking about this, and, and I wrote a small little, small little toast that I, I'd like to read out. Um, and so if anybody wants to hold their glass up, feel free to do so. Um, and we'll come back and look at the tasting notes afterwards. But I'm going to hold mine up while I read out my little poem and a little toast. If you'll indulge me. A blend of grain and malt. A blend of grain and malt, a vision shared, plans declared, the bonder's hand, the blender nosing, the delicate art of whiskey composing, a blend of ifs and whats and why nots, a followed journey over land and sea, ships tracked, ships missed, plot twist, the trucks, the trains, the customs pains, following an Irish path from Clare to here, to there, to where, a lively community of friends and fans, daily notifications of Irish whiskey posts and plans, an idea embraced, the whiskey feverishly chased, a community of chat and crack and good-natured smack, a blend of grain and barley malted, a moment in a journey that we've all only started. Old whiskey, new friends, bonds forged, our first whiskey to be poured, a blend of grain and malt. To our story, our community, our whiskey, to Louise, to Larry, to journeys begun and only the start of the fun, I say Slauncha and thank you all very much. Slauncha. To you all. Good help. Hi. It's a big moment. Mm. Louise, it's it, what are you? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful drop. It really is. Andrew says he's Andrew's crying. God love him, and he hasn't even sat, sipped the whiskey yet. <laughs> it is a remarkable whiskey on the nose. Oh yeah. Yeah. I was saying that aged kind of tropical fruit tone that comes from some of those O2 casks, like big old papaya mango kind of notes, I think. Soft, gushy kind of fruit. Yeah, the tropical fruits coming through in the nose, pineapple, mango, green, yellow. Yeah, very much so. Uh and that one to two percent contribution of that that older malt does that even that small quantity can live can can shine can it in, in a blend of this of this type oh it can yeah you're getting the you know you're that's a sherry cask so you're gonna and it's a very very sherry cask like it's hard it's a bomb of a sherry cask so um you're 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 certainly seeing it in the color of the whiskey because um uh, it certainly adds to that, but I, you definitely get those sherry notes from it too, I think. Mm. Mm. Lovely, big kind of, I all, I'm, all, I'm trying to put it in the context of American flavors. I often say hobnob, which is kind of a cookie over here. It's like lovely kind of malty, um, big round brown kind of flavors i don't know what's a good comparison with a hobnob in america what would it be now I, I i think it's the it's it's that dry cookie graham graham cracker cookie um yeah. type of crumbliness yeah, like, we, we would call like it a biscuit crust. right yeah yeah cracker crust yeah almost, yeah. yeah like a little bit toasted mm, a little definitely. bit toasted a little bit sweet but but a little bit crumbly yeah what we think yeah. of as a biscuity malt what, yes. what, what do you think larry this is uh, different from uh, the other blends, and I've uh, had the good fortune to, to try most of them. Um, so Louise, I, I'm uh, excited that you were able to do this from your library of flavors. This is uh, a great accomplishment. And you know, there's one other thing I think I'd like to put out there for your community, Barry, and that is um, I, I think they really need to hear that uh, they're the beneficiaries of uh, your audacity of the optimist to make an ask for people that 
truly wanted to say it it probably wasn't likely this could happen i mean i'm looking at the calendar here and you know we're just a little over a week before christmas um this wasn't really possible to do but uh, you encouraged us you cajoled us and um, thank you for doing that because i think we're all proud of the outcome very polite larry there with using the word encouragement um larry <laughs> Larry took many of my calls with such grace and patience as we tried to get this to be the most, not just the most amazing whiskey, but the most seamless experience from start to finish. And to, it's to Larry and Louise's credit that we have this amazing whiskey. And look, shipping what was ended up, what ended up being 600 bottles between miniatures and large all over the country at Christmas time doesn't come without its issues uh, through nobody, you know, you're handing over your goods to others in the hope that they get there in time. And amazingly, I think we've like you've delivered just incredibly, and and what a gift this is to us. And I'm trying to soak in the flavor and the taste here and just think about it. But yeah, it is a, it's a, it's remarkable that this all came together. It really is remarkable. I, I think we had the easiest time of it in Ireland because I I we put it on a truck in September and then that was it. And that's like the not the easy part, but like we we were we were we just kind of sat back because. I think the miracle has been worked by by you guys, particularly Larry. And I, and I have to. I know we're in a, a circle of appreciation here, but I do have to say, Larry, um, what you're very visionary in making this happen, you know. And and I think the fact that you recognise you're really bringing a lot of Irish whiskey, certainly JJ Curry, to to places that they wouldn't otherwise go. So thank you for having the courage to to facilitate this as well. It's it's not an easy not an easy road. Um, Folsom have some incredible stocks of whiskey over there and are well worth um, buying from when you can because Larry just makes it seamless. Larry, what was the biggest challenge in all of this? Louise said she had the easiest job of all. I think I'd argue I had the easiest job of all. But Larry, what what was the, the biggest headache? You're amongst friends now who have their whiskey. So what was the biggest headache? <laughs> well, from the beginning... Uh, it's easy to forget that we are in a once in a century pandemic. I mean, the world is in a healthcare crisis right now. And I think that uh, for those of us lucky enough not to have uh, caught this horrible disease, uh, we forget that the impact that it's had on uh, many of the large cities that uh, we've had to ask people and workers to transport the goods to offload it from the ship, to load it to the trucks. And it, it was a little dicey sometimes because uh, we didn't have perfect communication because people were not working from their offices all the time. Um, I, I would say that was the first challenge. And of course, uh, the second challenge going into the holidays is to ship all of these unique orders out to uh, individuals and, and get them out properly. Um, well, one upside is, is that uh, we, I did hire on uh, someone to use a little bit of extra packing material. So as far as I know, all of the bottles were delivered without mishap. Uh, we've gotten no feedback. Uh, I checked with FedEx earlier today and everything's been delivered. And I don't know of any broken bottles. So Barry, I think you've got some good news you can announce there. <laughs> Yeah, that is amazing uh, that we were able to get so many, and the wrapping was incredible. Um, you could have driven a forklift over those bottles, Larry. No, I, I know. Please don't say that. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is not a, a, a an encouragement or a no. command for all that are listening. But yeah, the good news is that we have a you know we have a few bottles that have uh, that we kept aside for breakage. Uh, I think a handful of bottles, and so we're going to work through our list. There was a couple of people. Um, next on the list that we're going to offer up those bottles to over the next um, week or so. Give us a chance to get get over this week, but early next week we'll try and make those bottles available. Um, if you've already bought got one, maybe you'll leave space for somebody else who hasn't yet got one. So that is the good news, and Larry was smart enough to leave some aside uh, in case of breakage. And I've been part of tasting events and private events where whiskey's almost always something breaks. Uh, not the case here, which was which was incredible. So, so uh, Larry, kudos uh, to you and the team for that. Uh, and um, and Larry's right there, he, there. There are some incredible whiskeys, and Louise mentioned the same at Folsom. So, for those of you that do want to check out more of JJ Corey's whiskeys, 
go visit Fulton Wine and Spirits website. There are other great whiskeys there from JJ Carey, uh, which ties into an earlier question, Louise. I think it was from Rick. Would there be another JJ Carey blend or release that has a profile in any way like the story? Um, not quite, no. I think not, not really. No, this is quite unique, I think. We, we did one release way, way, way back called The Old Tom. It never made it to America. But in terms of kind of profile, uh, it, was, it was kind of around there. I think the unique part here is the, the combination of the malt casks that we have. Um, they're all very, very unctuous fruit casks, right? In, in, in that they're that really kind of, you know, tropical fruit, the pineapples and the papaya and the, and the mangoes and things like that. So the, the combination of the 2002 and the 2006 casks really take it um, in a much more pronounced direction from a flavor standpoint. Um, uh, so it, there's nothing really similar to this, like th th certainly that's widely available. Um, yeah, this is a pretty special blend for us. You know, we, we do have very often we have blends that we play around with and we have kind of waiting in the wings, but we, we pulled out the stops on this one. Um, that, that 2% of the, the, um, uh, the 1991 malt as well from that particular sherry cask is giving it, uh, you know, those kind of sherry sort of um, uh, nuances to it as well. It's a very well balanced, uh, big, round, bold kind of whiskey from us, I think. It's... Um... I'm looking at the comments uh, of, of, of those who are tasting along with us, and that is everybody. And there are some really great, great uh, notes coming through and great feedback. The nose is incredible. Uh, Martin's has amazing flavor. Um, let me see what else have we got here. Um, loads of great comments about the packaging. Uh, Larry, you're, you've got a, a future in packaging, if all else fails, it seems. Um, Demetrius has finished his miniature, I think, already. Uh, let me see. Peter tastes cinnamon and sweetness. Um, the highlight of the pandemic for Rob. That's great news. Look, and a great point that you make, Larry, a once in a century pandemic. And uh, what does Barry decide to do? Sure, why don't we release a whiskey? Wouldn't that be a good thing to do? And uh, to, to your credit, nobody ever said no. Uh, I, neither of you have that in your vocabulary. You, you, you'd, you'd very graciously think about the answer, but it was never no, which was amazing. Clearly, you missed the body language. <laughs> that, that's the benefit of just calling you. I don't get to see your, uh, how upset you really are at my latest request. <laughs> um, Chad Menege says it's the best whiskey he's ever had, loving the fruit notes. Oh, good. Robert says that uh, the sherry cask comes out at the end just marvelous. Next time, 800 bottles, please. Mm -hmm. Smooth is overused, but in this case, it is applicable. Mm -hmm. um, Mark Gillespie, our friend at WhiskeyCast, wants to know uh, the website for Folsom. We can put that up on the screen there. I'll put that up for those who want it, FolsomWineSpirits.com. Let me add that to the screen. Thanks for that, Mark. Okay. Hey, Mark. God, you know what? I miss Mark. I miss, I miss all of you guys. I miss seeing all of you guys in person, just seeing you in uh, on on zoom isn't enough i wish that we could all do this in person next time guys you know we'll definitely do it in person we yeah. definitely will um larry um so listen thank you so much for joining us thank you for for being part of this this launch it's been incredible um you don't know it yet but you have more work ahead of you we're already scheming and good. uh good. And, and as you know, we are. there is another project we're all working on that has been top secret that nobody knows about, uh, but we, we, um, we might talk about in, in the future. But uh, watch this space, everybody, and Larry will be, uh, will be back. Um, he'll be dragged kicking and screaming in to help us again with all the requests we were after putting on him. But uh, it. Thank you. All right, Larry. Thanks a million for joining Larry, us. Larry, thank Slanta. you so much Good for evening. all your support. Greatly appreciate it. Louise, can, can you talk us through these casks again? So the last time that we explored these casks properly was when we sampled the four different uh, blends that you sent over to me. But I have this, this graphic here that I, I put up on the screen. Um, what can you tell us about the difference in these casks to help us understand what's in, what's in this bottle? First thing is, this is a much higher percentage of malt, of single malt than most blends would ever be. It'd be very rare to see a 50-50 blend, wouldn't it? 
It is, yeah. Like we we very often do sixty forties, but like normally seventy thirty or less would kind of be the uh, the the vibe. And then with a blend as well, like it's very rare that you'd see. Um, maybe it's not fair to say it's very rare, but I, I think it's quite rare to see people use the older stocks in the blend, uh, particularly kind of recently, um, because they're just very hard to come by essentially. So, you know, you could argue that a lot of these can kind of stand up as, as single malts in their own right. Um, uh, so the way that we kind of make whiskey in general, we're very much about the blend of JJ Kari. So when we, anytime we sort of make a whiskey, what we do is we'll look at all the different components of the whiskey that we're, we're putting together and we'll figure out what the heart of it is. And the heart of this blend is the, the, the two 2002 casks. So that's comprising of um, like 30 something percent, 30, 32% of the whole blend. It's like the, the core of it. So um, we knew that we need to get two of those casks that would really kind of sit beside each other and blend together well in a separate vatting. So uh, all of the casks that we have, like you saw on the rack house, are kind of pulled out and um, they're put into different kind of flavor blocks. And what we were looking for, I wanted this to be a big whiskey um, rather than a light sipper. Like it's definitely a sipper. It's, it's definitely, it's, it's a beautiful sit down and sip, but it's more of kind of, a, for me, a, uh, a savor, you know, it's a long, it's a glass that you can, you can make it last, essentially. So I wanted this to be a very big, well-rounded balance. So those 2002 casks, um, they'll be ex-bourbon casks, second or third fill, meaning that there have been a couple of different whiskies in them prior. There certainly have been a fill of bourbon and there might have been one or two fills of Irish whiskey prior. So you're not okay. getting a lot of wood influence then from those casks. And, and what we went for was those kind of more um, uh, tropical fruit sort of flavors that, that to, to come out of those kind of casks. Um, and we really kind of honed in on that essentially. Uh, and then we batted those two casks together as their own kind of little whiskey for a small while to see how they, they worked. And then we started to build on it. Um, I knew the 91 cask we were gonna use because we, we have a very, um, uh, a very, very, uh, we, we, had a, we have a very sherried 1991 cask. And by that, I mean, um, it was a really kind of fresh sherry cask. And uh, the, the whiskey itself that's in there has been in that cask for like 29 years. And it, it tastes kind of like sherry and it smells kind of like sherry and it's really, really dark. And I knew that was the kind of nuance that maybe we were sort of going after. Um, so I knew that it would be very pronounced and it would have a good effect as a top note on the blend. And then for the 2006, um, that actually was more kind of, um, uh, uh, it, it was less kind of tropical fruits and more sort of red berry kind of fruits almost, I'd say, um, just less kind of unctuous than the, the tropical fruits and I figured it would balance it. So that was kind of the thinking around the different malt components. Uh, we put all the malt components together um and that worked quite well and then for the green components um we uh we kind of picked a few sort of what we call grassy casks um and uh, a couple of sort of vanilla casks as well and sort of put those together uh to give the balance essentially so um you're, you're getting a whiskey that's very kind of full it's just very full it's well rounded um there's layers and nuance of character to it but it's one that you can, you'll think about for a while and you'll go back to. So my recommendation would be is to hang on to the bottle for a while <laughs> and come back to it. Um, come back to it over Christmas. Like this is a great whiskey for Christmas, I think as well. Um, I always find that we have, we end up having winter, summer whiskeys. It just kind of naturally sort of happens. And this for me is a sit beside the fire um, kind of kind of Christmas Christmas Eve kind of whiskey, I think. Um, so yeah, that's it. Like uh, I, this is my blending book here in front of me, and I often look at this for my notes because all of the all the whiskeys that we do are blended via these kind of really scribbly mad notes. Like there's no laboratory at JJ Corey. It's just like, what does that taste like? Will it match with something else? That's kind of what we go after. But yeah, in terms of where all these casts are from. 
There's not many places they can be from up north and uh, Cooley, quite frankly, because uh, back in the day, that's the only people on the island who was making those those whiskies that age. So we, we, we could say unofficially and without recording it in any documentation that these casks uh, would have come from Bushmills and Cooley. Unofficially, yeah. yeah, In a roundabout way. In a roundabout way. In a roundabout way, through yeah. middlemen and etc. cetera. Yeah. Um, the, we t I tasted this first, a like cask strength. And we when we tasted it, and we'll, we'll put that video up for people to see again. Uh, by the way, all of the videos that Louise has shared, tonight's tasting, every bit of content, piece of content information that's been shared about this along the way is going to be put together on a website. It's going to go live tomorrow. I'm going to send everybody the link so you can look back. We're going to have the breakdown of the grain, the malt uh, in there. It, the whole journey will be documented on a website and that you can visit. Um, but when we tasted this sample number four, which is the, the one that eventually became the story, there was agreement that at cask strength, it was too much. It, it, it didn't allow all the flavors to shine through. And you brought it down to 46%. And now we're getting to see layers, textures. Yeah. It's opening up and it's not being masked by too much heat of a higher strength. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's really important. Like even in the glass, uh, you know, when you go back to it, go back to it, go back to it, like you're going to get, you're going to get different layers. So it's like there, there's, there's those darker kind of flavors coming through. Like there's burnt vanilla kind of, I think, and a bit of almost, um, leather and things like that that start to come through as you go back to it go back to it and they get they they, they start to reveal themselves uh it's it's the, the the goal in blending right and this is like this is it's a really hard thing to do and we we're always chasing it the goal is to get a whiskey to reveal itself over time like you know you've got your nose you've got your palate and your finish but then there's like a load of layers in between. And when you go back to a whiskey, the ideal scenario is it's giving you something else. Your palate has time to sort of get used to the alcohol and then you're going back and back and back again. And sometimes with cask strength, for some people, especially like the, the, the alcohol tends to just mask a lot of stuff. So at 46%, after about three sips, your palate is on it, it gets it. And more layers of flavor start to be revealed. Um, so we, we like 46% and that's what 92 proof basically. It's just a nice place to be. It means we don't have to chill filter the whiskey or anything. And it, it's just, it's, it's a lovely spot. But, you know, I'd be interested to see what people think, like um, any kind of tasting notes that people call out. Let me put up some of the notes there. And I got to yeah. cork this bottle. People are afraid of their lives that this will fall off. And uh, yeah, just in case. Uh, and by the way, I just poured a little drop. Like you, you mentioned, people um, finding sometimes the alcohol masks the taste. Little little trick that somebody told me one time, pour a little drop into your hand, rub it on your hand, the alcohol will burn off and you'll be left with some of the notes and flavors. You can smell your hand and there's incredible oak wood coming through there for those of you who want to try a different flavor. Just a small drop in your hand now, don't pour a bucket into your hand. Um, let me see, some, uh, some notes coming through. Uh, definitely, Catherine can definitely taste the pineapple let me see what else. Uh, Stacy can taste the grassy notes like fresh straw bales. The layers on the palate are great, says Anthony. Um, a fruit, uh, let me see. John says, who's got maybe the biggest collection of JJ Curry this side of the Atlantic. Uh, it's like a cousin. A fruit bomb note of the gale is there, but it's this, but it's the own whiskey and has notes beyond that fruit and a light heat. Oh, that's, you know, that's so interesting because, yeah, it, like for me, it is a cousin of the gale. It, but it's a it's a maybe a second or third cousin but it's there definitely it's so nice to hear you say that because we're trying to build a style here and and this is an offshoot of a style for us but it's it's i'm very it's a very comfortable kind of style that we're in so it's very nice to hear that thank you um it has spawned more orders brian just ordered two bottles of the gale batch one might be his favorite overall irish whiskey other than the story good save thank you good save. um were there's caramels coming through i get that as well um, yeah, you get yeah. that. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's definitely, um, yeah, that, that like, like uh, it, it's an offshoot of the, of the hobnobby kind of thing to me. You know, that chocolate hobnob thing, definitely the the Werther's caramel. While we're looking at these tasting notes and while we're sipping, and I'm sure everyone's on to their second, third, or sixteenth pour, should we bring um, Claire back in to give us another tune, the first tune of a to celebrate the opening of a bottle? Why not? 
Why, Why not? not? Claire, I don't know if you're listening on standby sheet. Look at this, amazing. Claire is ready, rocking and rolling. <laughs> Let me see. There she is. Claire, welcome back. You moved everybody with your uh, the chapel gates of Cura Claire. Um, we're sorry we don't have any whiskey in front of you now. It was very uh, an oversight. It's fine. I, I can't drink it legally anyway here. <laughs> Yeah, Claire, Claire, oh. Claire is uh, not official. You're 20, what are you, 20 though, 20. Soon to be 21, but yeah, 20. There you go. Yeah. Uh, I will turn a blind eye, we'll turn a blind eye. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me see, are there, Louise, what, what songs rep, like, represent Claire? Like Claire is the home of Irish music, isn't it? It's where you'd send your American cousins to go and experience in Doolin and in, 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 in Ennis and, and in great small towns so throughout Clare, it's, it's where traditional music lives on. Yeah, like this is, uh, you know, we, we grew, I grew up, I, the village of Cora Clare has three pubs, right? It has one church, one shop, and three pubs. And every one of those pubs is hopping, um, you know, certain nights of the year with just random people playing music. You know, they don't start until midnight and then it goes on until about six or seven in the morning. And you are expected to sing a song, right? You are just called upon to sing a song and you must sing that song. So um, it's, and, it, and it's one of those places that, like the Chapel Gates Cora Claire, for example, it's just one of these songs that gets kind of passed down and the only way that people learn it is in the pub. It, it's not on the radio kind of thing. So there's a lot of lo lovely, lovely, lovely kind of songs that are close to people's hearts. Um, they all tend to be quite sad, unfortunately. <laughs> like, <laughs> Claire had a tough time of it. Claire, County Claire, not not this Claire. Like Claire, <laughs> County Claire was invaded by the British. We had a terrible time in the famine. So a lot of the songs are very um, uh, evocative, I would say, of of difficult times. Uh, and I don't know what else to do about that because that's just the way that it is. <laughs> um, so I don't know, Claire. Do you know? Um, Lovely Rose of Clare or Caledonia. So a few bars of that or I think I know Lovely Rose of Clare, um, a bit of it. Cool. It's a beautiful song. Yeah. Yeah, do you want to do Lovely Rose of Clare? I, I'm sorry we don't have anything incredibly upbeat, but everything is <laughs> No, no, no. Whiskey's for crying into we shouldn't be laughing or smiling. <laughs> Nobody's enjoying themselves tonight. This is a, a miserable affair tonight. So please bring it on. <laughs> Let's do Lovely Rose of Clare because that, that unfortunately is a song about somebody uh, who's had to emigrate as they always had to emigrate and is, is pining for their, um, their lost love back home in County Clare. Take it away, Clare. Let's go. <laughs> oh, my lovely Rose of Clare, you're the sweetest girl I know. You're the queen of all the roses, like the pretty flowers that grow. You are the sunshine of my life, so beautiful and fair. And I will always love you, my lovely Rose of Clare. Oh, the sun it shone out like a jewel on the long, long hills of Clare. As I strolled along with my sweet love one evening at the fair. Her eyes, they shone like silver streams on her long, long golden hair. For I have won the heart of one, my lovely Rose of Clare. Oh, my lovely Rose of Clare, you're the sweetest girl I know. You're the queen of all the roses, like the pretty flowers that grow. You are the sunshine of my life, so beautiful and fair. And I will always love you, my lovely Rose of Clare. That's all I know. I know there's more, but I don't have it. There's about 40, 40 more verses, but that's... That's, that's, really that's, the problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's beautiful, Claire. That's, oh, it's a beautiful song. And uh, Kieran mentioned that his, his father sang it to him. Uh, Every day when he was younger, uh, the lovely Rosa Claire, beautiful, beautiful tune. Um, we don't often get it, uh, hear it from somebody called Claire about Claire, uh, yeah. all in one place. We, we were nailing all the uh, the, the check Bit boxes here. Situation going on. <laughs> Goosebumps. Um, I'm going to put up here all the claps and virtual cheers for you, Claire, because you deserve them. Um, Claire, you rock. Beautiful. Uh, all the onions. 
poor, poor Kieran's in bits up there in New Jersey. Um, woohoo, lots of woohoos. <laughs> um, Claire, will you come back in a minute uh, as we're when we when we when we sign or when we're close to signing off because you mentioned a beautiful closing number, uh, the parting glass, which we dare not sing it before uh, we uh, we open all the doors and let the cold wind in and let everybody out. So, um, will you come back to us in a minute? Sure, I'll be here. Fair play. Thanks, Claire. Aren't you very lucky to be finding talented family members to work the farm and sing you songs and. You, you have a great life altogether. The family yeah, turning Claire, up to lift barrels. And Claire's dad is my cousin, Pat, who used to torment me when I was younger, obviously. And he emigrated <laughs> to Chicago, God, in the, in the late 80s, I suppose. Um, and I, we, I have a lot of family over there. Like, I have two aunts who emigrated to Alabama and New Jersey, respectively. So I have a load of cousins all over the country. And then Pat moved over to Chicago I lived in America for a while as well. Um, uh, you know, we, we have really good connections, essentially. There's Pat and Claire and uh, um, Claire and Maeve as well. Oh, the whole family are really talented. Maeve was supposed to join us as well. She's an, a, like a, a brilliant concertinist and pianist, but she has an exam. Um, but they're so, so, so talented. Like, the, like, I'm a really good pub singer at about 4 a.m., right after we're adult. almost there we're <laughs> almost there <laughs> but claire is an actual talent an actual talent as you can all see you know we're very lucky and then and then and then her dad's sister caroline has just joined the business so caroline sheedy is claire's aunt and she lives up the road and when you guys come to visit um caroline will either i'll be here showing you around or caroline will be showing you around she's our head of hospitality and um, she's kind of running all the hospitality here on site and everything. So, yeah, it's great. I can just rope everybody into the business. It's brilliant. You you have an amazing team there that we should give a shout out to because I know they're, they're lurking in the background in the comments and with their drop of the story in their own glasses to Neve and Eric and Blaze. Uh, amazing team that uh, I've had the, jo the joy of hanging out with you all in, in London and in Dublin and in different places. And you've, you've managed to find a great... A team that's just great fun and great crack. And um, what's the secret of finding these people? Like, how did they? How did this bunch all come together? You know, I just like I used to work in really big corporations and um, like massive multinational corporations, and I I just used to work with so many people I hated working with <laughs> <laughs> that when I founded my own business, I was like, I don't need to do that anymore. I'm just going to work with people that are. A, fundamentally good at what they do and B, fit with the ethos of what we're trying to do here. Like, this is the drinks business. You know, we're not uh, saving lives. What we're trying to do <laughs> is bring a bit of light and enjoyment into people's world, right? Yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's a serious business at the end of the day. But, you know, if you, we're not selling widgets. We're selling whiskey and we're selling um, moments like this and, 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 and social moments. So to work in this industry, as well in the industry, you have to have that ethos you know you have to be able to not take yourself too seriously and enjoy yourself so i've been very fortunate in that we've managed to find those people and keep them you know everybody's been since i founded the business like blaze has been with, been with me since day one and the people that have joined have stayed around we're still tiny only five people but we have an incredible team and i'm very lucky i've, I've enjoyed any opportunity to hang out with with any of them from I found out with Blaze in New York, Blaze in London, and you in London, and and Neve and Eric over there as well, and it's always been a good time. And so when people get to visit the farm, maybe they'll get to see Eric busy blending, or somebody, or Ruby uh, scurrying about. <laughs> everyone's got a role. Oh, everyone's got a role. Ruby's the more, chief morale officer, definitely. Um, this I I'm just. Every, every sip I'm taking, I'm getting new notes. But the thing that's coming out to me is this beautiful caramelly sweetness meeting gooseberries, mangoes, guava. That, that those pineapple exotic fruit notes are they specific to are, are, are they notes that would be typical with an older Irish single malt predominantly? They are like from, from my 
certainly from my experience of, of sourcing that kind of stock, yes, like we see it, we see that coming through kind of again and again, like um, uh, th those particular notes in, in that parcel are really kind of prevalent. And they're prevalent now in the new, not the newer stock, but the most recent acquisition I have as well. You know, it was a period in time and, a, and, a, and it's, I look there, the notes that people look for in Irish whiskey as well. So they'll, they'll be distilled to, to, to that essentially. Um, so definitely. And I think we're very fortunate, you know, um, they're so pronounced in Irish whiskey that I really enjoy grabbing them and pulling them out as, and emphasizing them as much as we can. Um, and then you get a surprise, like you're saying, Barry, with you've got those tropical fruit notes and then you get those darker kind of malty um, uh, sort of flavors that start to come through at the back end of, 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 of it, which is a really nice balance. Um, so, yeah, we, we look for those tones and we chase them down. And we, if we could like those two, two, those two 2002 casts are very pronounced in that regard. And we, we look at it. We look for those. Oh, it's a it's a big night, a big night, uh, a big launch. Um, if anyone's got any questions while we we finish sipping up here, um, p feel free to put them in the comments there. I see so many of you posting five thousand pictures as you should to the Facebook group. Please do. I want to see you enjoying this. I want to see these open bottles. You know, so often limited release bottles are snapped up and end up being flipped or end up in auctions. And what I've while I have no doubt a couple of the story bottles will end up in an auction somewhere, what I'm most impressed with is how you, the Irish whiskey community in America, have joined 100% with this journey, which was as a community, not opening the bottles, waiting for tonight, getting excited with me, making me even more excited. I've never been part of something like this in my whole life, and it is a gift to me. It's just a personal joy and something I'll never forget. This is the first ever whiskey that we've released, and it's all thanks to the Irish whiskey community. So I, I just want to raise a glass to you who who bought this, who purchased this, who followed the journey. I mean, there's no words. I'll have words tomorrow, but not tonight. Like tonight is just slaunch and thank you for, for joining us on this. And I, I've never had more fun than I'm having right now. So slaunch I'm on my third pour of 18 tonight. So I appreciate you all. Yeah, and I will say like for, for us as well, um, as JJ Corey, like we're a we're a brand new brand, you know. We're um, we're only three or four years old. It's like we're only we've only been in the U.S. for like the best part of two years now, I suppose, really. And to have um, just to have you to have you all in front of us and allow us to tell our story through Barry and through this community and kind of showcase what we can do as whiskey bonders and tell you about our approach is really valuable and I really value your time. And Barry is right, sometimes we'll launch a whiskey and I make whiskey for drinking. I make whiskey as a very young company, you want people to drink your whiskey because that's how you advertise. <laughs> you don't have right. an advertising budget, so you want people to drink it so that they can tell, they can enjoy it and then maybe go back and ask for another whiskey. Um, and normally we'll do a very small release like this and probably 80% of the bottles go to auction or something. And it's, I always find it a bit depressing. I just really want people to enjoy this whiskey and sip it. This is why we do this, right? You guys all sitting there, we're having an old bit of song, we're, we're having a chat, we're talking about the whiskey, we're, we're sharing it amongst ourselves. This is what it's for and this is what whiskey's about. So I reiterate that. Cheers to all of you um, and cheers to Barry for making it all happen. Slauncha. The story will never be repeated. Uh, for those of you asking when it's going to be available for distribution, this will never happen again. Like this is a once off. There will never be another story. There's not going to be a story two. There will be, the reason I are already scheming, but there will never be another, the story. So it's this, to me, it captured this moment in time, which was this growth of Irish whiskey interest in America, our wonderful burgeoning community growing friendship with the team at JJ Curry with myself, Louise and everybody else. Like it's just been a wonderful, wonderful experience that it can never be replicated as it was for this particular release. Does that mean that we can't try and top it and do other things? I mean, we can, but the story is for this moment. It's not for, it wasn't designed for auction sites. It was designed for tonight for us all together. Look, there's 120 people online right now across YouTube and Facebook. 
that have come together. There's nowhere else, I'm telling you, in, in, in America right now where 120 people are gathered to sip Irish whiskey and to hang out and to share a glass. This is history. It is the first Irish whiskey that was ever released in America to a Facebook group. I think it's the fastest ever an Irish whiskey has sold out in America. It's the first ever collaboration between JJ Curry and, uh, and a, a community like ours. And it's Stories and Sips First Whiskey. You're all part of history. You're part of an amazing moment. And I couldn't be prouder and I couldn't be happier. So I'm just going to have a, a, a bean from ear to ear. Mrs. Stories and Sips is sitting off camera here who refuses to come on camera, but she's giving me big thumbs up here and big smiles. Share a thumb. Give us a thumbs up. Look, um, oh, here comes a thumb. Here's a thumb. There's a thumb. All right, that's what you're going to see. So it's <laughs> going to everybody. <laughs> mm. um, so look, we're part of history. We've opened the bottles. I don't know. what. Where can we go from here? Um, let me see. All the questions, I think, have been answered. Uh, <laughs> Larry, Larry has said, no story too, never say never. There'll be other things, but it might not be the story too. We'll be more imaginative than that. I've got ideas. I've got ideas. Nobody's heard my ideas yet, but they're coming. Um, let me see. What questions do we have? Uh, 120 people on a weekday, says Rob Leonard. He rushed home in a blizzard. Love you all. Thanks, Rob. We love you too. Thank you so much for your support. Um, I will say that along the way, there were moments of trepidation, of fear. Um, you know, where we invested in this program, all three of us, Larry, myself, you, Louise, like we all invested time, money, <laughs> with no guarantee of any return. Like there could have been bottles left on shelves. There could have been all kinds of, nobody might've been interested. And it was a bit of a risk and a gamble. And there was a, a big sigh of relief the day when this went live, when everybody within under four hours took all 600 bottles that blew my mind. And, but it doesn't always happen that way. And, and it just speaks to the amazing community that we have here, I think. Yeah, it's incredible. I think, um... That you can't underestimate the power that you guys have and how much we appreciate you guys because the internet has made it possible for very small companies like mine and small whiskey brands like mine to tell our story like across the country um uh you know it, there's it's a america's a weird place in terms of distribution and stuff like that so we're we're really really grateful for all of you know for you following us and making this happen um it means a lot to sort of small businesses like ours, essentially. There's, there's a question there. How many blends were done before the final four? Um, quite a few. I'm going to look at my little book here. Um, probably story, story, story. Uh, yeah, we had about, there was a number of different battings. Um, of the 2002 so lots of different ratios of the 2002 about 10 or 12 iterations of that and then um another like four or five iterations of um adding in the grain proportion and adding it in the, two, the 2006 proportion so probably all told around 20 25 different iterations before we hit the final four um, and that's very often just playing around with small uh, ratios, basically, like 10% of this versus 12% of this kind of thing. So quite a few. That, that preamble tends to be quite complicated. It's very, it's very intense in that regard. But yeah, about 2025. That's no joke, 2025 different yeah. blends to get to four, to get to one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah I... Go on. Well, I was just going to selfishly say I, I wanted to thank Melinda, Mrs. Stories and Sips, who's been part of this journey all the way along, who who, who keeps herself behind the camera but sneakily jumped in there. But um, give a wave or another quick look there. If you yeah, look, come if, in, if Melinda. Say there. hello. Say hello. Say hello. Say hello. This is Mrs. Stories and Sips, who is the, the brains and the beauty behind the operation. And honestly, we couldn't have done any of this without her because uh, she puts up with the whiskey madness and the reorganizing of our very small apartment to become <laughs> the story stories and sips central and uh, it, it, it's a kitchen come broadcast studio on the best of nights so um thank you Welcome. <laughs> she's been sipping away enjoying the story every now and again throughout the night an empty glass has found its way back in front of me <laughs> with a, a kind of a nudge <laughs> thank you You're welcome. thank you Minda. we know behind every great man 
there she is right there <laughs> that's it that's it thanks louise brian, brian riley just lost 20 dollars. she is real she does exist you yeah, know i i am married yeah it's a fact i know shocking as that may seem that uh, somebody would put up with all this I, I do have a very generous and kind wife um listen we we've had a, an amazing kickoff i'm not going to uh belabored the point here but this is a, an amazing kickoff louise an amazing whiskey an incredible uh, thank you so much for helping us bring this to market we're all the better for it uh, you have many new fans we know where stop number one is going to be on the stories and sips tour of ireland it's going to be to the farm where we're going to take it over and declare some kind of independence and our own currency uh, and uh, 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 take it from there um i wonder where do we go from here i mean uh, we we've I don't know, can we top tonight? I mean, can we top this release? Do you think we can top this? I do, I wanna do something really cool. Yeah, I definitely do. Like there's there's rabbits from the hat that we can pull and there's there's more ways that we can get people involved. So I think we have a second act. I'd like to see a second act. Well, Louise, you have been an incredible partner and friend throughout all of this and have made us all very happy you've made us look good <laughs> and you've just done amazing things to, to bring this to market so we, we can't thank you enough for for your friendship and your partnership and um yes the, the the first place we could the only place we could possibly turn for uh to try and top this is back to you and, and put the uh the pressure back on yourself but i know you've shared some ideas i've got some ideas all we'll say right now is that stay tuned because if you think this was good we're going to try and knock this out of the water uh for the next thing that we're going to do and uh, so, uh, yeah, a lot, lot to see in the future. Um, what, what can we add? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everybody. 2020 is nearly over. It's been a very good end to 2020 on my, my end anyway, definitely. Um, uh, so that's all I, I can say. Thank you for all your support, Barry. It's a great way for us as JJ Carey to end the year. and. It's a hell of a good whiskey, if I say so myself. It's a fantastic whiskey. You've knocked it out of the park. I think we should bring Claire back in um, to to sing us out, maybe, uh, for, for, for the end of the night. But, Louise, thank you so much for everything you've done. Thanks, Eric and Eve and Blaze and Caroline and, and everybody who's been part of this, and Larry, of course. And thanks to you, the Irish whiskey community, Irish whiskey fans of America. Put your pictures in the group. Let us see them. I'll announce the website tomorrow that you can all go and relive this entire journey uh, and visit it and uh, reminisce while you sip on your story. But until then, uh, thanks, Louise. Thanks, the community. Thanks, Larry. And we'll leave you with that, with Claire coming in and giving us uh, maybe a, a parting song, perhaps. This is the... Oh, there we go. Let's see. <laughs> of all the money that e'er I had, I spent it in good company, and all the harm that e'er I done, alas, it was to none but me. And all I done for want of wit, for memory now I can't recall, so fail to me parting glass. Good night. And joy be with you all. So fill to me the parting glass and drink a health, whatever befalls. Then gently rise and softly call. Good night and joy be with you all. Good night and joy be with you all. Good night, everybody. Hi, Claire. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving us your voice, your talent. Thank you so much. Merry Christmas. Thanks, Claire. Yes. That's it, Louise. We're, we've, we, you've knocked it out of the park. We've got no All more. Right. <laughs> that was great. Thanks Are we so on much. stage? Are we backstage? We're, or? we're still live. No, we're still live. We're about to wrap up. That's it. Um, but listen, thank you everyone who's stuck with us uh, throughout, throughout this journey. And we had a great hour and a half session tonight. We'd do it in person if we could. All we can say is we will when we can. And everyone's invited. And please go and visit County Clare. Take your 
little ticket that you got with your bottle with you and Louise will welcome you and show you around and show you perhaps even the cask where the story, uh, the cask that the story came from. But uh, this has been amazing. This is, the, this is the start of my Christmas. I know it's the last broadcast for JJ Corey for the year. Um, this is going to be a tough one to top. I'm blown away. I'm almost speechless, but I'm going to keep filling my glass. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you in the Facebook group. Thanks for joining us. It's been an amazing night. Thanks for all your support. We'll see you shortly. Sláinte. Sláinte.